Hello, you're watching the Smoking Out Coffee Show. My name is Mo Patel, where every day, Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we talk to startup founders and people in the startup world. I'm joined today with... Hey guys, I'm Jeff Putton down here in San Diego. And today we've got a great, uh, great interview with Luke from PolarBee.com. He's uh, been in the industry for many, many years, working at places like Yahoo, uh, being behind the scenes for massive, massive internet companies like eBay. And he decided to jump ship and create his own startup, uh, several, a couple actually in, uh, under his belt. Uh, he talked briefly about that and, and uh, he sold that to Twitter. And now he's working on Polar, and which is a sort of polling app for the masses. Uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit about Polar. Yeah, Polar is really cool, really well designed, uh, beautiful app uh, that also is a web application that you can get to from uh, you know the internet or your web browser. Uh, if your friends post it to Facebook and things like that, you can still get to it. But it's a great app for your iPhone. Like if you're standing in line, you have a few minutes to waste. You know, people love to look at things like Instagram photos and. Uh, things like that, and this really gives you a quick, easy way to look at a couple photos and make a quick decision, which one you like better, uh, make the decision and move on to the next one. Uh, so it really gets a, a ton of votes from a lot of people really quickly where you can decide what people's sentiment is uh, one way or another out of a, a rather large poll set. Yeah, and uh, typically um, polls and surveys online are very horribly designed usually, and from a user experience, you know, it's like pulling teeth. You know, people really don't like filling these things out. I know I don't. And, you know, uh, Luke has sort of turned that on its head. He's, he's turned these things into entertainment. Uh, we know this stuff works because uh, there was a, a site, you know, several years ago called uh, Hot or Not, and uh, it, it was huge. Um, and, of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg took that sort of idea and, and down, you know, hacked into the servers at Harvard and downloaded all these females' pictures and, and used that to sort of build his first startup. If you've seen the social network, you'll know what I mean. And so... Uh, yeah, he, he's doing this for, kind of for all kinds of categories. Um, Jeff's pulled up a screenshot here of um, a poll of cars, I guess, uh, Turbo S versus the 2014 GTR, and which one would you rather drive, an Audi or a BMW? And so um, we briefly talked about his business model, you know, raising money, um, all of that. Um, you know, as far, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is, this is a huge area. And uh, there's many ways to monetize this audience, and we briefly uh, touched on those uh, points. Jeff? Yeah, I think it's just such a beautiful and simple product, you know, and they, may, they, they do a lot of hard work to make it look so simple. But really, it, uh, you know, comes down to that. And we talked about the monetization and the in-stream ads that might be a potential down the road. You probably wouldn't even notice them as ads. Maybe they put a little thing that says sponsored by on there, but it wouldn't be annoying or uh, take you out of your usual consumption or um, interaction with the app. So I really do think it's a beautiful um, you know, ecosystem that they've built. Uh, also to mention, the, uh, the polls are user submitted, user generated. So people, uh, you know, I think it says who uh, is asking the question here in a little avatar of them. Uh, they do a really beautiful job of letting people create them. And we get to see a little bit of behind the scenes how they're um, curating the community to make sure that it, uh, you know, they put off a, a really beautiful first impression. Uh, and there's a, a lot of details like that that make this really come together into a succinct uh, product. Yeah, and so uh, with that, I think you're going to learn a lot uh, in terms of um, you know what kind of things you're going to need if you are a startup uh, founder or a person that has an idea and how to raise money. Uh, this is a great example of, of a great-looking product and early traction, and he was able to raise some money from some very large uh, people in the Internet world. Uh, Jerry Yang from Yahoo, one of the founders of Yahoo, in fact, invested in him. Uh, so anyways, uh, please check out the interview and tell your friends and colleagues at work uh, about us. Uh, we love getting uh, emails. Uh, email us at info at smokinghotcoffee.com. Uh, and, of course, subscribe us. Subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher and all that. Uh, Jeff? Yep, please subscribe, guys. It means a lot to us. Tell your friends. Uh, if this interview has been worthwhile for yourself, hopefully uh, your friends and colleagues and coworkers will also uh, find use in it. Yep, and so with that, let's cut to our show. Hey, Luke, how you doing? Thanks for coming on the show. I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's our pleasure to have you. So uh, I've been a big fan of your work and I've uh, been following you uh, from a distance, kind of lurking you a little bit, looking at your site over the several years. And then, of course, uh, the TechCrunch uh, article. And I was like, I looked at it and I thought, hot or not, face smash. You know, like I just, uh, instant ding, 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 ding. 
uh, went off in my head. And, you know, the idea of getting people's opinions and getting people to share them is is really great. And, and people want to do that. Obviously, Hot or Not is a fantastic example of that. And Mark uh, capitalized on that. Uh, tell us more about your background and where, you know, was that the impetus? Where did Polar come from? All that kind of thing. Sure. Well, let's continue that Polar thread for a second. So sure. basically where we're coming from is everybody's got an opinion. And uh, I'm going to tell you my opinion whether you want to hear it or not. That's right. Um, it's sort of human nature. And at the same time, pretty much every organization, group out there also wants to hear about people who, who use their service, don't use their service, uses someone else's service. Yep. They're always out there in sort of opinion collection mode, right? Feedback collection mode. Right. But uh, when you think about the Internet and you think about how people do that, it's forms and it's surveys, which is essentially the equivalent of saying runaway screaming. Uh, forms and yeah. surveys are so bad that companies literally pay people to go take them, and even then they have like 0.01%, um, maybe more like 0.1% conversion rate. Right. So our, our take on this is, look, this is a real need. People want to share their opinions. They want to collect opinions, but the tools for doing this online are just abysmally bad. Right. So what yeah. we've tried to do using some of the models that you're describing is you know, make it a fun and entertaining experience. Make it something that people will do because they like it. Right. Um, you know, things like face mash that you mentioned earlier. People weren't thinking of it as a survey. They are thinking of it as a game, sort yeah. of an interactive experience. That's right. You know, that's right. how we started to put Polar together as a way to chip away at this area uh, sort of from the side, right? Like we're not saying this is a survey tool. We're saying, hey, this is a uh, social interactive experience that right. ultimately actually gives you really big insights. Right, right. No, the hot or not thing, if we can just go into that really quickly, that thing blew up big time. I mean, huge. Uh, people just love staring at people's faces and rating them. I, it's genius. Uh, uh, did you, uh, when did the Polar come up? Did, were you like, oh, I got to do something with this, and then just kind of just d lay dormant until iPhone, iOS thing took off, and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to do this. Is that what happened? Like, where did... No, I think it was more noticing how people use mobile devices in a very different way. And so what everybody's out there trying to do is basically shrink forms down to a smaller screen yeah. instead of rethinking, like, what's actually a way to collect feedback that works well on mobile. If you think about a mobile device, right, let me demonstrate with a little remote. You got it in one hand most of the time. You sort of have your thumb going like this and this. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah. the way you're, you're scrolling, and you're kind of hitting things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a study that my friend Stephen Huber did, that was like 75% of interactions with a smartphone out of the 1,300 people he observed out there in the world, okay. they were using a thumb as their primary interaction point. Right. So we kind of took that as inspiration. We took the way people pick up and put down mobile devices, a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there, and we said, hey, this is actually an interesting way to yeah. kind of say, hey, this surveys don't have to be what you're used to. Polls don't have to be what you expected in the desktop internet. They can actually be an entertaining, mobile-driven kind of experience. So I think it, it stemmed a lot more from there. And the way we got into photography is, again, when you think about what drives people's use on mobile, what do they do? They're on Instagram all the time. They're sharing right. photos. Now they're Snapchatting disposable photos. Right. right. Uh, you know, Snapchat does 150 million photos a day. Yeah. It's madness, man. Million photos it is, a day. It is madness. Yeah. That's that's close to 200 million images shared yeah. a day just it's, in those two it's apps. It's so crazy. People just do not want the stuff forever around. They they want disposable media. It's, it's wild. Yeah, it's, yes, but like in both cases, what's driving that? It's photos, right? It's like that's and again, when you think about mobile, you can communicate so much more in an image really quickly yeah. than you could ever do with text and type and reading and it's, it's it's sort of those things are not very well suited to these small portable screens, right. whereas images are incredibly well suited to it. So that's how we kind of got to that visual design. Okay. And so it was kind of that, you know, one thumb interaction, how are people going to use this thing to use it quickly? Right. Oh, let's right. make it visual because pictures sort of rule the day on mobile. And the combination of those two things is really what drove the interface you see today. Cool. It, it looks like you completely changed the perception, too, of, of what the app is itself, right? Uh, how many of the people using Polar are coming from a link versus opening up the app directly while they're maybe standing in line and have an extra five minutes? 
Yeah, that's that's changing really rapidly. So when we started out, like 95% of the traffic was, or the votes in particular, were people opening the app. Okay. Now we're starting to do a lot more web distribution, and that number is shifting, so that web is taking over a lot more of that. Wow. We've had oh, a lot okay. of our poll sets sort of picked up by popular press and talked wow. about. Yeah, uh, I know. I definitely saw a few of them in my uh, social feeds. Yeah, so people are starting to pick it up more. And so we built a whole system where these things are accessible on the web and you can vote in a browser on the phone, on a tablet, or on a desktop. And there's lots more activity happening there these days than we used to have. I don't know if it's if the, the app is still dominant by far, but okay. the web is starting to gain. Well, I have to say, uh, Luke, uh, anytime I uh, go on, I think it's Adobe or some of these other larger sites, and it's like, oh, that little plus thing comes up in the corner. It's the most annoying thing, man. Trying to get me to give me feedback, and ah, uh, it's it's horrible. I'm I'm just yeah. I just think to myself, like, man, how much is Adobe paying this company uh, to do this? And their like their conversions have got to be like point zero one something super small. Yeah. I mean, I, they're I just, sub one percent basically. Yeah, yeah, sub one percent. Because you know, is that worth interrupting people when they come to your site with this big pop over to get that sub one percent? But that's how much they want the feedback, right? That's how much they care about these opinions that they're willing to put this crap experience on there that has less than one percent conversion. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. madness, and I'm just surprised it, nobody's fixed that problem. It's a big problem, and yeah. uh, I'm surprised nobody's doing it for the enterprise and all that kind of thing. Obviously, you're doing it more entertainment consumer. Uh, so are you, is this like your thing, man? Are you making money off of this, or is this just a little side fund gig? Or? Yeah, we're, we're, a, we're a venture funded company, so we raised a round of $1.2 million wow. back in February. Jeff, did he say 1.2? <laughs> yeah, I believe so, 1.2 million. <laughs> so that's a, a big problem Whoa. that you're solving here. This isn't just a, you know, a people to oh. spend their spare time. <laughs> yeah, well, again, if you consider who out there is trying to gather opinions, right? Like, it's everybody. Right. Every single organization, like you pointed out, that Adobe site. Here's a, a multi-billion-dollar company yeah, yeah, yeah. out there throwing this this I would say crappy yeah. experience. I would agree. At people just for um, you know a couple little bits of feedback and some clicks on a radio button and checkbox here and there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you contrast that to sort of what we've done recently, so yeah, uh, here's a couple examples that can maybe illustrate this. I know you guys wanted to show some screens. Yeah, I don't know if this absolutely. is a good time. Yeah, sure. let's, 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 yeah, let's get into it. So let me uh, show you one of these things. Uh, let me pop that open. Uh, so here on the front page, hopefully you guys can see this action. Yep, looks great. Into that. All right, great. So here on the front page, you can see a couple of these topic areas. But for you, We were looking at this one earlier, but this is sort of the iOS 6 versus iOS 7. Uh, icon battle, yeah, and you can see right here on the first one we've got 220,000 votes on new iOS 7 versus 9,800, or sorry, 21,929 votes versus um, 9,800 on the old one. You can just really quickly say, you know, I like the old one, yeah. or I like the new one, mm -hmm. and we gathered total on this page. There's something like I don't know 30 or so polls on here, but total on this page we've gathered around 870,000. Votes. Holy cow, that is insane, incredible. man. That is incredible. Yes. And the, in the interesting thing about this is there's this widespread sentiment out there that, uh, you know, that people don't like the new look of iOS 7 okay. first, and people are going to rebel against it. But what we found through running these votes, and this is an article that the Next Web wrote about this as it was sort of a third of the way through voting, okay. if you will. Yeah. But after you know, close to three hundred thousand votes, sixty percent of people, sixty-six percent of people actually like the new ones. Oh. yeah. How about that? Which is counter to what public opinion shows, right? And then they can kind of see which ones are winning, which ones need the most work. So, like Safari, Game Center, and Camera are kind of losers. <laughs> are, are, <laughs> they, are they things. compiling these from your from your site? Yeah. Okay. Wow. This wow. is all from a uh, fantastic from the polar man. Polls. Yeah, talking. Yeah, Service Polar. That's wow, so that's a, a really great example, actually, when, you know, we kind of see this with, like, the Facebook news feed often. People are very boisterous about, like, oh, we hate this, but in reality, most of the people are, uh, you know, in favor of it. Yeah, and, it, like, here's another example. So Yahoo is running this campaign of 30 different di logos over 30 days. Okay. And so we started a whole series around this, and there's around 52 or 53,000 votes. Wow. 
on this, and basically what we found is most people dislike every single one of their new logos except for one. <laughs> one right, let's check it out. Which one? I'm, I'm curious. Well, here it is. This one is actually winning about three to one. So day 10 oh. is the only one that has beaten the original so far. Yeah, yeah. I can see why. And you can kind of vote really quickly yeah, and easily on here. Wow. Well, you see here we got like, I don't know, what is this, 2,000, 4,000 votes on that first poll. So, so. It, it, in this one, in this particular instance, I know you've got a, you've, you've worked at Yahoo in the past. Um, was this, is Yahoo somehow funding this, or are they, are you, are they paying you? or how? No, 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 we just put this together. So, like, if you look at what's happening on the site, people build their own collections of all this stuff. Okay. So the one I showed you there is actually the Yahoo logos. It was one that I put together. Gotcha. But mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of other topics out there, like uh, interior design. You know, people are comparing all these different styles. Uh, and this is a tag, so you see lots of different users. Okay. Yeah. Inside of a tag, right? There's right. three or four different ones. Right. Right. Similarly, so that's kind of people who are into inner interior design. Then there's the car fight tag where people are comparing different car types and concept cars and car styles mm -hmm. and wow. back, front, you name it. Wow. wow, that's great. So you have your users, um, I assume from like the mobile app, uh, creating these different polls themselves? Yep. This is, yeah, it's all user-generated. So even the ones I showed you, I was the user who made those Yahoo logo polls, that right? That is brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, the, a lot of startups, the holy grail is a, a bootstrapping that user-generated content thing and getting people to start, you know, contributing, you know, without, you know, yeah, pushing everybody. Absolutely. That was one of the hardest things to get up and running, I think. Yeah. So how did, uh, not to veer too much off of this, but how did you get that going? And, and it looks like you, you know, you raised a significant amount of money. Uh, what, what is the business model here? Is it, are you monetizing a polar? Some, is it a paid app or? Yeah. So these are two set, these are two separate, um, questions. So <laughs> let's, okay. let's go down the first one. How do we sure. kind of do the community? One of our first hires is actually a community manager. Okay. Mm. So when we built the company up, we hired some engineers, we hired a designer, and we hired a community manager. And the community manager's job from day one is to make sure that everybody on the site is a community, right? So it feels and actually interacts as a group of people there for a shared purpose. We do a lot with adminning. Um, I can actually, here, I'll show you a little behind-the-scenes yeah, look if you guys are interested. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the wrong behind the scenes. Let me show you a different behind the scenes. So this is the system that we have for managing everything on Polar. Okay. And it's a fully responsive system, so we can go do this on a phone. Oh, we nice. can go do this on a tablet, or we Very can go cool. do this on a desktop machine. Right. And so what's happening is you can actually see a lot of the content coming in right now. So here's the content coming in. And we can go ahead and flag things if they're inappropriate or appropriate. We can kind of give some stuff some love if uh, we think it's actually something that is representative of the kind of content we want on the site. And when oh, you I say see. give something love, you mean push it to your front page or somehow? Yeah, like... exactly. So, for example, this is sort of interesting. The CIA acknowledges Area 51 exists but doesn't mention aliens. Yeah, that's that's a kind headline. of cool ball. We like that, right? So yeah. I'm going to just push it to the top of the popular list. Oh, that's what that, that is. Gotcha. You wanna show off, right? Very cool. And there's other flags, like certain things get flagged for different age groups, certain things get flagged for different tags. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a whole system where we're monitoring all the, the comments. We're not actually looking at every single one of these, but if one of the like keywords comes up. Okay. So we have, for example, um, filters around profanity. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, I probably shouldn't be showing this. Oh, no, that's <laughs> fine. Actually, no, I want to see this. This is great. <laughs> you get the idea, though, right? So we, we, do, we have a lot of tools built to try and make sure that everybody's well behaved, that nobody's abusing anybody else, that sort of inappropriate behavior is squelched, mm -hmm. yeah. and all those things are key to keeping that community active and engaged. Wow. Like if you know if people are out there trolling or abusing others, that creates a really negative environment. Right. If uh, the content that we're featuring isn't good, then people don't come back because there's nothing interesting right. for them. Yeah. Right. right, so it's it's very much an ongoing uh, management flow. Gotcha. I, I no, love it's great how that you've got. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Tools for it. We we've talked so much, and we'll write about how how important it is to launch a community with kind of that established theme and you know feeling of cohesion, uh, making sure that you drive people towards the the right sort of content that you want on there. Yeah, it's. I would say it's a very underappreciated aspect of this stuff. You know, a lot of people yeah. think let's just launch it. 
and uh, we'll be there, right? We're done. Right. Oh, we launched it. Okay, now and then right. we just take hand, a hands-off approach. Right. But in reality, there's you know just ongoing maintenance to make sure that things are on the up and up. Yeah. And we have a set of you know community guidelines associated with all these things that what we like you to do, what we don't allow, and we're very, I would say, vigilant about making sure people stick to that. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, I just love that you built those tools uh, up front. You know, to to address it head on. It's great. Yeah, I would say that we built them gradually, right? We're, day okay. one, we definitely didn't have that much <laughs> okay. in All place. Right. Right. But over time, we've built up, as you can see, a pretty uh, pretty robust back-end system to take care of all this stuff for us. Gotcha. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, let, let's uh, get into the uh, the business model or the monetization. Here oh, yeah, right sure. So question right. number two. Question number yeah, two. Uh, so as I said before, there's no shortage of people out there looking for opinions. Uh, the stage we're at right now is we're basically building out the right product and we haven't started doing any monetization. Okay. But if you look forward, there is absolutely no reason why if we get the right audience and we have the right level of engagement, people wouldn't be putting questions in here that they want promoted. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, like here I can, uh, let's go back to the admin thing and uh, let's see what we can find. So for example, if uh, I am someone like Starbucks, right? Okay. <clears throat> sure. There's one. You know, what do you prefer, the frappuccino or the coffee? Which? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, or you could get into their seasonal flavors and. You can get and, into season, and you can do lots of things like targeting people. So, for example, if uh, there's an example of like Dunkin' Donuts versus Starbucks, right? Yeah. What you can do is say, "Hey, I'm Starbucks. I want to ask everybody that prefers Dunkin' Donuts a question." Mm. Uh -huh. And then we can grab everybody that said Dunkin' Donuts here. Most people prefer Starbucks. But we can grab everybody that said Dunkin' Donuts and send them a poll that says, uh, what do you love about Dunkin' Donuts, the cheap price or the quality? And if people who ah. say cheap price, you can say, oh, you know, is it 50 cents? Or You know, we're not doing any of these things right, right yeah, now. Right, yeah, yeah. But long term, there's a huge potential to sort of bring these opinions um, to the fore. And what we're basically doing is, I guess, ads as content, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we don't have an intent to go throwing banner ads well, or any of those. Well, that's, I, I'm glad you're, we're talking about this. I was going to ask you. So let's say you were targeting all those Dunkin' Donuts folks. Um, yeah. and, and so you're thinking Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts would put in a specific poll, and it would and it'd be part of the feed. So it wouldn't be overtly like, you know, we're asking you this. It would just be sort of seeded into the feed, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah. Uh, and you can go follow some of these brands right now. So there's a couple. Let me see if I can... Uh... Dig up uh, here, for example. Yeah. You know, a company like Red Mango can go in there and make an account right now and start asking wow. questions if they want. We actually had some really interesting ones. There's a couple like defense. I think this is like a bridge builder. Oh. And they did this whole series around sort of bridge battles. Whoa. <laughs> interesting. Across the different. <laughs> wow. So that was kind of cool. And, you know, these are these are companies and organizations that are doing these sorts of things. And they're experimenting with the platform, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, for us, we've got, you know, I think the most interesting stuff for me is some of the stuff around um, the way you can organize these things by tags. Okay. Yeah. So here's sort of a series I did around like flexible displays on smartphones. Oh. And I sort of took a lot of the news that's coming out about different display types right. on smartphones and asked a bunch of questions and really quickly we get a lot of opinion on like, you know, do you think this is a gimmick or a game changer? Right. It's like yeah. most people think it's sort of gimmicky. Right. You know, what's more interesting to you, the fact that a, a flexible display could be unbreakable or the fact that you can show your little updates on the side? Right. Like nobody cares about the updates on the oh. side. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I have to say, uh, this is genius, Luke. I mean, uh, now it sounds like you just have to grow, grow this platform so you have a large consumer base to offer to these advertisers. Yeah, and that's kind of the mode we're in. So uh, some of the stuff that we're working on right now is really making these things embeddable. Uh, I was just so going to ask that. Example, if you want to go write about the Yahoo 30-day logo parade, you can just take this whole set of polls and go stick it on your website. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So you don't have to be like that next web article I showed you earlier about the iOS 7 icons. You can just take that, put it in there, and um, go. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I mean, or, you know, I could see if you're in the next web and writing about the flexible displays and you just want to throw one question out there, uh, it would be a great way to put an interactive... Uh, you know, left or right polar pole in there. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the idea. 
Wow. That's beautiful. So that's kind of the next thing we're doing in terms of distribution and growing stuff. Okay. We've been, I'm building out the mobile app experience and kind of putting all the fundamentals in place. Right. <laughs> so now we're moving towards uh, taking the stuff further. And there's also lots of very funny things as well, too, like uh, Let's see it. tiny cars. <laughs> tiny cars, okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Tiny car segue. Yeah. <laughs> tiny cool. cars and tiny cats. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. So people have a, have a lot of fun with this platform, oh, yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I love some, this is great. I mean, Luke, cool you're really, you're almost creating entertainment. Yeah, it's absolutely. Well, that's you, the idea, right? Yeah. As I said before, like, currently, polls and surveys make you want to gag. Yeah. yeah. So what we're trying to do is flip that on its head Perhaps maybe too much. Maybe we're going too far down the entertainment and fun kind of aspect of things. Right. But that's where we're starting. Right. Um, and the average person that picks up the app votes. We get about 40 votes per user per day, sometimes a little over that. Wow. Yeah. Damn, People that is some serious there, engagement so. right there, my friend. Working on it. Yeah. Wow. Very so, early days still. Very early days. So okay. who knows how this will turn out. All right. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, uh, very impressed, man. I This is this is really great. Um yeah, you can cut back to your face now so we can talk a little further. Okay, go. So, let's turn off the tiny cars, huh? Yeah, turn off the tiny cars. <laughs> yeah, we're getting distracted by all the uh, Exactly, the I'm like reading here. Um, so how much um, from your front-end design experience, how much of the polls do you use for sentiment of like front-end UI? I mean, I think it's so useful just to be able to throw a ton of people at it, like the Yahoo ones and the iOS icons. Yeah. It's very yeah, interesting from a designer point of view. Totally. We do that kind of stuff with uh, all the features we actually put into the site. Oh, so cool. what we'll do is we'll do polls around what feature do you want to see next. Ah. Uh, what should Polar do now? Do you want this feature to work like this or like that? Wow. Uh, we did a whole series on when we redid all the icons within the app. Mm -hmm. There's a oh, okay. series of polls there. But um, we also have our community making a lot of these questions. So they'll ask questions like, what do you want Polar to do next? This or that. Huh. And a lot of our feature ideas have actually come from listening to the thing people are requesting right. and building that. This is like uh, this is like a genius feedback machine, man. It's yeah. It's 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 a feedback machine. We'll see how genius it is. Time <laughs> time. I, I, I will tell, right? Listen, man. I don't see how you can uh, fail if you just keep making this stuff fun and engaging, and which sounds yeah, like yeah, the you engagement are. for sure. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of um, you know your funding, I, I I didn't know you'd raise so much. I'm like. Let me raise my uh, cup of coffee to you, man. Congrats. Uh, how hard was that, man? How'd you pull that off? Oh, this is. I did a startup prior to this, and uh, we sold that to Twitter back in uh, August of 2011. So through that, I had made a lot of contacts in the VC community through my time at eBay and at Yahoo. Okay. Um, I had made a lot of contacts there. So. Uh, for example, one of our funders is uh, Jerry Yang, who is the CEO of Yahoo, yeah. and uh, Ash Patel from Murado Ventures, who is the CPO of Yahoo. Okay. So those are old Yahoo friends. Okay. That sort of helped and support us early on. Wow. So uh, if there is a developer listening to this in new, in somewhere some far off land, uh, what would you tell him if, if he's trying to raise some money for his mobile startup? Let's say. Yeah. So when we went into it. We had a prototype built, and we had a vision, and we had an idea, so we were pretty far along. Um, I think it gets harder at each stage that you go down, so if you just start with an idea, it's really hard. Right. If you start with an idea and a great team in place, then it's a little easier. If you start with an idea and a great team and an early prototype, it's easier. If you start with an idea, a prototype, and some early traction, it's even some easier, traction. right? So like, gotcha. the more you have, the more you can hold out and kind of do on your own, I think the better off you are. Right. Because you will prove to yourself whether or not it's actually something worth going out and raising money for. Well, let's talk a little about that. So, uh, did you have a prototype up, and then did you th show it to you know Jerry yeah. or? You, you, so you did. Okay. Yeah, we had it up, and we saw. We basically launched it. We launched it around December of uh, 2012, okay. and then we raised money in February. Wow. So we had it out there. We had people using it. We saw how they were using it. So we were, you know, like three or four steps up the ladder, right. if you will, from just an idea. Right. And we had a team. We had a prototype. We launched it. We had people using it, which is a lot more to go on right. than um, if you're just starting from from paper, right? How big is uh -huh. your team right now? Uh, there's five of us. So there's 
two full-time developers, one full-time contracting developer, our community manager, visual designer, and uh, me. Gotcha. Are you guys all virtual or all in the same area? Uh, three of us are in the Bay Area, and three of us are in uh, Boston. So the dev team are two full-time guys, and the one contractor is out in Boston, and then everybody else is in the Bay Area. Very cool. Um, what tools have you found really to help you know um, keep the team cohesive? Uh, do you use like uh, an always-on sort of hangout or, or chat or any of that sort yes. of thing? Or yep, absolutely. Uh, Basecamp for kind of ongoing stuff. Then we use Skype for conferences, conference calls, kind of like the way we're using this. Right. <laughs> and uh, then we actually use Google Spreadsheets <laughs> for our, our QA. Okay. So it's basically Google Docs for spreadsheets, and we list out the features on there. We'll rattle them off. We'll assign the people. It's it's like a four-tab spreadsheet. That's how we do features, okay. requirements, and QA testing. Okay. So nothing on standard, right? Right. Just some a couple basic tools to keep us cohesive, and obviously talking a lot um, helps as well. Very cool. Um, can you tell us? I mean, I I don't really know much about this this startup that you did sell to Twitter. What what was that about, and how did you end up selling it? Yeah, so uh, we had a company called Bag Check, which was around the the basic idea was everybody that has a hobby or a passion is really into the gear they use for it, and they talk about that gear all the time. So we tried to put that online. Okay. So if you're a photographer, you have built up your collection of lenses and camera bodies, and you know, I mean, and you know yeah, yeah. exactly why you have everything. Right, right. So you're sort of this expert on it. Right. And so we allow people to really quickly make lists of these things and talk about what they use and why. Um, and uh, we had that product out publicly for about nine months or so when um, we started some conversations with Twitter and actually a couple other companies here and there. And... Uh, yeah, the process just kind of got to a point where we're like, hey, this actually is a good opportunity for us, and we should take it. D you did know, you... When we started, we were still gung-ho about going and building the product and working right. towards it, but um, I think when you run your own company, you become very rooted in the pragmatic reality of what it takes to make something successful. Right. And again, like the perception is I'm gonna go write some code over the weekend in my underwear and I'm gonna be a billionaire the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's happened maybe three times out of right. you know hundreds of thousands if, if not more. Right. People that have written code in their underwear, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so did uh, you did you initiate yeah. the like hey Twitter you might want to consider acquiring it? Like how did that all come about? That's what I'm No a lot of this stuff happens through the network of, you know, this is one of the reasons why you pick partners on the funding side that you like and you respect and do great things. So one of our uh, angel investors are actually on the board of Twitter. And so a lot of the instigation sort of came through him and through his relationships there. And, you know, being like, hey, you guys really should talk to these guys. And then we talk to them. And, you know, that, that's how a lot of this stuff kind of happens. Gotcha. Right? Someone's in the right place at the right time and makes the appropriate connection, and right. um, good things happen. Fingers crossed. For, for those yeah. that are, like I said, in New Zealand, and we're not even in the Bay Area, uh, do you think AngelList is sort of that mechanism now for most entrepreneurs? Yeah, uh, AngelList is a great place to have. You know, pe people in the venture community tell me if you're not on AngelList, you don't exist in their eyes. But I think in the early stage. Um, Sort of money raising areas. You have way more options in these days than you ever had yeah. before. There's lots and lots of sort of like super angel groups and um, teams that will go invest just a small amount of money to help you get off the ground. There's things like Y Combinator, which is an entire training program right. for startups. That there's just been so much built up over the years that previously didn't exist. That it's a great opportunity to start to do this st sort of stuff. And uh, people look at that and say, oh, well, this, you know, there's a bubble here. And, but everything is going to be software. Yeah. If you look at the world, every single industry, pretty much everything is going to be digital in some major way. Okay. So whether you're okay. selling lingerie or whether you're selling groceries or whether you're running a restaurant, or, software is going to be part of it. So I think there's no shortage of opportunities, which is why you see so much interest in funding these technology companies now. Because okay. um, everything is getting transformed, will get transformed even more and faster, and right. God knows what else is going to happen. 
Yeah, that sounds very similar. I've heard that whole software is eating the world kind of. You're definitely on that bandwagon. Oh, look around you, right? Like it's really hard to dispute. Yeah, yeah, no, you're no, it's right true. About that. Yeah. So, do you think the the little guy trying to start up uh, writing software in their their room that should they keep at it wherever they are in the world, or do you think there's a great enough uh, payoff in moving to Silicon Valley to to be surrounded by the energy and the up the connections and all the networking opportunity? Uh, I'm really biased. Yeah, I wouldn't live anywhere else yeah, in the is. world. Yes, but that's just me. Right. Um, I think the ecosystem that's developed here. So, somebody put it to me really smartly one way. It was like, you know, places like New York, they got the money. Places like uh, Boston, where they have Harvard and MIT, they got the brains. But Silicon Valley has the money and the brains. Yeah. And as a result, that is a very unique area and plus there's so there's those two things plus there's just this deep rooted sense of optimism and um, belief in trying things here that you don't get in other places like for a company like us you know five guys working on sort of a small service with a big idea being able to get a substantial amount of investment to work at that for a year like nobody really bats an eye at that they're like, right. yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, do that. You know, try it, see what happens. Like right. that's the attitude, right? It's very, and, very. And that might seem crazy in Middle America or anywhere oh, yeah. else, really. It would seem pretty crazy in Middle America, I would say. <laughs> How much of a difference does that make in your daily life then? Uh, to it's you know, huge. keep keep at this entrepreneurial effort. That's like sometimes it's an uphill battle, right? Every day. Yeah, but I mean, everybody around you is doing similar things, right? Okay. And you have examples of success all around you. You drive up the road. There's Apple. There's Yahoo. There's Google. There's YouTube. Right, there's right, Facebook yeah. in Menlo yeah. Park. Right. right. You get up to San Francisco. There's Twitter. There. Yeah. You know. So, there's just examples of what success looks like, right. all around you, and I think that keeps you believing in the dream. Right. Keeps you motivated. Uh, which is yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of a collective vibe, right? Versus you being on your own somewhere else and maybe not having that support. Help you get through the tough times. Well, well yeah. you know, um, you know, I I was looking over your LinkedIn resume, and you got quite an impressive track record. All these big companies. How, what 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 did it? You know, when you left for Bagcheck, I'm assuming that's when you first jumped ship from a larger company to doing your own thing. What was it? I, what what convinced you? Like, oh, you know what, man? I I'm trying to do this on the side, and I just don't. I can't focus on two things. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna jump ship. Yeah. So uh, that. That in particular was really all about the people. So a uh, mutual friend of me and someone else who was at Yahoo at that time, who was a uh, the, the mutual friend was a VC. He got me and another guy together for lunch, and we both sort of discovered we had leanings to go and do something different, okay. rather than stay at Yahoo. And you know, I I actually knew this. He ended up being my co-founder at Bagcheck. This a guy named uh, Sam Polera, and we knew each other at Yahoo. We worked together there. We had great respect for each other. And we wanted to work together, but it was our mutual friend who basically got us together for lunch. He was like, look, you guys both want to go do something. You both right. want to work together. Just go and do it. Okay. Right? And he kind of kicked us in the butt, got us some space at his firm to do brainstorming for a couple months. Wow. And then, um, yeah. Think. So that's what I mean about that ecosystem, right? There's people who are not only just supportive, but will actually give you that push off the cliff. Wow. Yeah. They do things. So that's, it's easy to get comfortable, right? Um. And then yeah, he, absolutely. It's hard to make that first step <laughs> into entrepreneurship. Yeah, and that, having yeah. that co-founder, having another guy go in with you, that that's that's a huge help, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't do it by myself, right? Like, everything I do is with co-founder, partners, great team, all that kind of stuff. It's just too much for any one person to even imagine trying to do and then on of, their own. And then, of course, you, you get the big win by getting acquired and then uh, – and then I read on the on your LinkedIn profile that you refused to uh, you know to join the team over at Twitter. Uh, what was the motivation behind that? Re, I'm sure they're. Well, I, don't, I don't know if refuse oh, to is, the, wrong is word. the right term, but uh, basically, you know, I had done seven years of big internet companies from uh, eBay to Yahoo, so yeah. that was a total of you know pretty darn good chunk of my life. I got bit by the startup bug and yeah. uh, just wanted to keep doing it. Gotcha. So nothing at all against the team at Twitter. Right, right. They're doing amazing things, and they're gonna, you know, I'm actually invested in Twitter now in a pretty big way. Okay. Um, so I'm rooting for them and hope that uh, hope they get all the success they deserve. Right. 
Right? Oh, that's cool. I'm glad, I'm glad you were able to make that decision. I know it can be uh, difficult, or sometimes maybe they demand that you join the team, you know, with the acqui hire type thing. But yeah, uh, you know, it's important for them to have uh, you know great people working for them. But you know, I can totally appreciate your desire to go out on your own again and and not yeah. you know get consumed into one of these companies that was a startup not too long ago. But now they're kind of one of the big uh, the big players. They're definitely big. Definitely big. Yeah. And yeah. I think when we were talking to them, I think. I can't remember. I guess this was like two something years ago. You know, uh, they were way way smaller than than they are now, right? Yeah, so now yeah. it's even more dramatic. No, now they're massive, uh, man. But they're doing great. I mean, I'm, you know, I use Twitter multiple times every single day. So yeah. Um, so uh, you know, is I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about interface, user interface, and all that kind of thing. Um, is your what's your feeling with Google Glass and the user interface there? Um, do you think it's going to do well yeah, as a platform? Give us your thoughts. Uh, I, I mean, I have a pair. I've used it. Oh, okay. We tried to develop some things for it for a while. And um, I believe in the vision. I believe what they currently have out there is a very early prototype, which has some parts that make it very prohibitive to using in the way their vision suggests you should. Okay. All right. Uh, like I am, I'm not wearing it now. You're not. <laughs> I'm not no, going to wear it. That's I'm right. probably not going to wear it at all today. Okay. Um, I did. I forced myself actually to wear it around for a week. Okay. And I did some. Cra I went to like a Las Vegas casino floor. I uh, went through airport security. With actually lost. I was the first person to lose Google Glass. That was kind of fun. <laughs> well, wait a second. Um, oh, you were the first person to use Google Glass. Lose. 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 Oh, lose, lose. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more of a dubious honor than a. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Did, yeah. Did someone return it to you? Yeah. Yeah, actually, the TSA. Oh, okay. Excellent. So I, uh, somehow it fell out of my bag during the sort of security checkpoints, and they took it to some secure location. I had to go back there after a few days and get it out. Uh, what was your, after wearing it for a week, why, why aren't you wearing it now? What, what's the issue? What's the big issue? Uh, the big issue for me, maybe it's because I haven't worn glasses ever during my life. It's. You have it on your head. There's a piece of glass right here, which is very reflective. Okay. Uh, there's a battery and sort of a pack here, and so it's sitting on your head. It gets a little hot and heavy here. Yeah. The plastic is constantly reflecting, and it's in your resist field of vision here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unlike glasses, which allow you to see, this actually stops you from being able to see here and there, and it's very, okay. it's always there, right? Right. Mm -hmm. The other part is it, it's, it takes a lot of fidgeting to get it to be just right. Okay. Like if you don't get it exactly right, the screen is either blurred on the side or on top or bottom like this. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of futzing and sort of hassle to have on your face. Okay. So there's some pain, and uh, the value of it does not outweigh that pain. Yeah. So the value well, of me being able to go like this and see my email okay. is not high enough that I would deal with the battery pack and the glass yeah, and, and the, the weight fidgeting. and all these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. T talking about changing perceptions and everything, what do you think are the best applications for the glass? I mean, I haven't honestly put too much thought into it, but I don't think, you know, I spend, we spend a lot of time sitting at our desk doing digital design work or whatever. I don't see myself wearing, you know, wearing something like that when I've already got three screens in front of me or four or five. Uh, you know, do you see it best used when you're on the road, when you're out meeting people, or what would the, you know, having an overlay, like a heads-up display, I guess, type, you know, I don't, you know, checking email, you just pull out your phone anyways. Yeah. What is it best at? That the well, other right now, aren't? it's not really a heads-up display. Right now, it's okay. a floating screen in the sky, which essentially does a lot of what your smartphone does, okay. just in a little bit more of a limited capacity. And so you look up, and there's a little screen that shows you an email. You look up, there's a little screen that shows you the weather. So this quick access not having to pull out the phone is cool. Uh, the ability to take photos instantly of what you're seeing is pretty interesting. But I think some of the things that probably will make it most useful haven't been developed yet. So some of the technologies within it that are interesting to me is there's a bone oscillator that sits back here, okay. which essentially transmits audio into your ear by vibrating the bone behind your ear right here, wow. which means that's audio only you can hear. And I suspect there's a lot of applications that can be built with audio only you can hear and nobody else can, right? Okay. Well, that seems really interesting to you. The other thing that's interesting is using your full field of vision for a computing environment, sort of like a world space kind of environment. Uh, from what I've been told, the current iteration of that, of the 
tools you can build for Google Glass doesn't do that because based on the way the eye focuses and refocuses, it's very easy to make somebody quite ill okay. if you build an application in the correct way, in an incorrect way. Right? You can literally make someone vomit if you have too much motion and these sorts of things. So they really locked it down into a very restrictive single screen oh, environment. Gotcha. But being able to sort of go like this, let's yeah. say I'm going to San Diego, restaurant, Pier 31, right. boom, I'm there. Right. I mean, they have Street View. It already does this in compass mode on the phone. Make right. that a three-dimensional sort of world space. Right. Yeah. And essentially you have a wormhole to anywhere in the world, which is pretty darn useful. Oh, yeah, yeah pretty appealing. Uh, <laughs> other use cases like, uh, so they have Google Hangouts in it right now, but so the integration of Google Hangouts is a little, uh, it's not as seamless as it could be, but I could absolutely imagine I'm at the grocery store, I'm like, all right, which freaking rice am I buying for dinner? Yeah, you know, and yeah. then like, my wife takes over in my head, is go to the left, go to the left, okay, that one, all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all right. Like, that's uh -huh. totally pragmatic, practical use case. Right, right. right. Yeah, um, transformative, something that you couldn't do quite as the same today with the phone. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, you could, but you're like, yeah. Yeah, it would take ten times longer, I guess. It would take phone. ten times longer. You wouldn't longer. have that seamlessness. You couldn't hold the grocery cart bags. Right, yeah. Right, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is you're doing. So there, yeah. there's there's some practical applications here, uh, but all those applications require different building technology than they currently have. Mm -hmm. So right now what you're getting is like little cards of snippets of information primarily, and the camera. The camera is sort of the big one, the video camera and the uh, photos that you can take. Gotcha. In your opinion, you know, obviously being a UX UI guy, is this? I mean, I, wearing it for a week, did you kind of like took, take it off, and did you have like this? Oh man, I just can't wait. And ten years from now, when all this stuff is like, did you did you get all excited about the, but where it's going, or did you kind of be disappointed? We're like, oh yeah, the, fu the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. To quote William Gibson, right? Um, so I get excited about the internet and everything. And your eyes is just one more thing which digital stuff could probably enhance in some way. Mm. Uh, so is your ears, so is your you know your feet, your legs, pretty much everything, right? right. Yeah. So I'm excited about that big picture aspect of it. I don't know if I'm necessarily that excited about wearing a computer on my face, which right. is why I'm not wearing one right. on right. my face right now. Yeah. But uh, I know I've talked to people who have worn glasses on a regular basis that don't find it as uncomfortable as I found it. Uh, personally, I'm a little. I, I feel like the wrist form factor is a little bit more. How shall I say, natural to me? Because right. if I want it, I just go like this, right? Yeah. yeah. It's essentially the same gesture as I can do with glass, right? Without the burden of having something here all the time. In your yeah. face. Yeah. yeah. If it's just here, and I can kind of, you know, glance down at it, get that same snippet of information, it does a lot of what the current Google Glass interface can do. Right. In a way that. Um, just sort of more naturally, I guess, even socially acceptable, too, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. One of the things that was odd about wearing the glasses, I would go up to someone at Starbucks to order a coffee. Right. And I see them being like, <laughs> 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 like they're smirking at me because I got this computer on my face. Like, okay. Yeah, it looked like, a, looked like a Borg from Star Trek, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It was, so there was a couple moments like that. In crowds, it wasn't a big deal. Nobody really noticed it. Right. But when you were one on one with somebody, Right. And it, it was it's there. Right? Yeah, it's very yeah. apparent yeah, that yeah. it's there. It's definitely obvious. Interesting. Yeah, so how do you feel about the watches and the other devices? Anything else uh, that you're excited about? Yeah, I'm actually quite excited about... So I, I have this belief that uh, human ergonomics is really a great way to think about device form factors. Palm-sized devices, lap-sized devices, wall-sized devices. Yeah. And uh, I actually am quite interested in seeing what happens with wrist-sized devices. Because there was a reason why the watch evolved to be on the wrist. Right, yeah. It moved from a pocket watch, you know, to Flavor Flav clocks, and ultimately, like, it just settled down right. that the wrist on was the, the right place yeah, for yeah, it. And yeah. that took, you know, what, hundreds of years? Right, right. hundred years? So, I don't know well, when you know, the It's funny, watch. you mentioned that. I, that got me thinking about rings. I, I'm surprised that nobody's done, like, a display on a ring yet. I mean, people wear rings, right? Yeah. But what you could have with a ring is, like, a little NFC chip. Okay. Or an RFID, something or other here that does authentication. Mm. Just like you could have like a little clip for. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if rings are necessarily great for for uh, display unless yeah. they have a projection screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They do have these little micro laser right. projectors that can essentially display a keyboard. Yeah, yeah. On a typing surface. Right. Yeah. One of the most interesting uh, rumors I heard about the uh, 
Apple iWatch is that it's essentially a slap bracelet with a little projector. So you could project the dial pad onto a wall or project the keyboard onto a table. Oh, sort of that's a pretty cool rumor. We'll see. We'll see, yeah. Um, yeah, that stuff's pretty cool. I remember hearing about some of those uh, pocket-sized computers with the projector, keyboard, and screen yeah. for a while back from, like, HP or someone, but uh, it'd be great to see them in production. Yeah, yeah so it just hasn't been consumerized, right? Again, like, the yeah. so Bill Buxton has this great theory called the long nose of innovation. What he basically says is anything that's going to hit, like, multi-billions of people, or at least a billion people, was invented, like, 20 years ago. Oh. And then it sat in research for 10-something years, and then it sort of started to get commercialized, and then it hits its peak. Wow. So, yeah, stuff that came around, like, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, right? That's, uh, it's getting there. Right. It's time for it to go big, if it's going to ever go big. Well, you know, we've, uh, we've had you on for almost an hour here, so I'm just going to quickly wrap it up by asking you, like, where do you see the future of uh, Polar going, and... Are you trying to build a much larger team here? You want to keep it small for a while? What's going to happen in the next six to twelve months? Yeah, so uh, we're focused. Uh, we got a couple more releases come in with our app. So we're working on one right now, and then we got one more, and I think we'll get it to a state where we're pretty happy with it, and then move on to some of this distribution stuff that we talked about earlier. Yeah. So that's kind of our immediate roadmap, and we'll find out if that means we need to hire more people or think differently. I don't know. Right. As as a startup, you tend to think. Uh, very long term and very short term yeah. at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta be tactful. Yeah, the next six months is important. So you're really gonna focus on product for a little bit here before you go into distribution. That's right? yeah. That's all we focus on right now is getting the product right. Gotcha. Well, yeah. We didn't talk about it too much, but you say mobile first with everything, right? Uh, yeah. So hopefully that applies to these future fields as well or devices. Yeah. I hope so. I, I I think there's just something about the portability of stuff that makes it sort of accelerates it. The fact that I got my phone with me anywhere and everywhere, it's yeah. connected to the network and always on. Right. That makes it something that's much more relevant to me every day than the laptop I have at my office or yeah. sitting in my bag or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the port, that's again why I think the wrist form factor and the body form factors are really compelling. Right. Because they're always there, always on and always connected. And one last question before you go, is there a specific uh a uh, need or problem out there that you're like aching for some entrepreneur out there listening to solve? Ah, good question. Um, there are so many things that should get fixed <laughs> out there that I don't know if I can even begin okay. to start listing them off. But um, yeah, just look for a pain point, right? Look for a problem you have. Like our pain point is forms and surveys suck. That's the problem we see every. And you mentioned it. You've even had experiences with oh, it, yeah. right? And so yeah, has everybody yeah. else, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, as soon as you have something like that, that you're like, oh, this is crap. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There Work you on go. that for a while. Right. right. Gotcha. Well, very cool. Well, thanks again, Luke, for coming on, man. I sh I really appreciate it. if people want to get a hold of you or on Twitter. What's a good good way to do that? Uh, Luke W. Great. At Luke W. And uh, Luke W. dot com, right? Yep. And works uh, on the internet's and the twitters. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man, and hopefully we'll check back with you in a, in a few months, see how you're doing. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. Bye.